Amen. Well, as I betted you guys, uh, apparently, again, it was last week while I was on vacation. Bill, he had a rough week, right, Bill? Oh, thank you for playing along. And apparently he got up that Monday morning and he was getting ready for work and Diane approaches him and she goes, hey, I bet you don't know what today is. And so Bill, he just kind of indignantly, he's just, well, of course I do, right? So get this, man, 10 a.m. that morning, Diane gets a box of long stem roses delivered to her office, right? And then at 1 p.m., she gets this foil-wrapped two-pound box of her favorite chocolate. And then later that day, a boutique delivered a designer dress for her. And Diane, she couldn't take it anymore, right? So she calls Bill at work, and she says, Honey, <laughs> this has been the best Groundhog Day ever. <laughs> this is awesome, right? Yeah. So Bill, he's steaming about all that money he just spent on Groundhog Day gifts, right? And so, uh, but he had to go to the dentist to get some work done on his teeth, right? And he gets there, and the dentist sits him in the chair, and he says, Open wider. And then he shouted to Bill, he goes, good grief, you've got the biggest cavity I've ever seen. The biggest cavity I've ever seen. And Bill said, okay, listen, Doc, I'm scared enough without you saying something like that twice. And the dentist said, I didn't, that was the echo. (laughs) And so now Bill's leaving the dentist's office, right? And he's going down the elevator and he sees this golden retriever on the floor next to this guy. And and being a pet lover and all, so he asks the guy, he says, hey, uh, does your dog bite? And the guy says, nope, sure doesn't. So Bill, you know, he lowers his hand to pet the dog, and all of a sudden the dog bites Bill's hand, starts tearing it apart, shredding on it, chewing it, and Bill's screaming and swinging the dog around the elevator, trying to get it off his hand, right? And finally he gets the dog off of his hand, throws it out of the elevator, and so he menacingly looks over to that guy and says, hey, I thought you said your dog didn't bite. And the guy says, he doesn't. That's not my dog. <laughs> right? And so finally after this, Bill makes it home, and he sees Diane. She's sitting on the couch. She's chewing her nails, right? And apparently this is a pet peeve of Bill's, chewing the nails, right? And, and so she reassured him that, listen, uh, she's got a new solution to cure her habit of biting her nails. And she went out and bought a whole year's supply of these Lee press-on nail kit things, right? And so Bill said, unfortunately, without thinking, well, that's a great idea. Now you can eat them straight out of the box. <laughs> now, you know why I visited Bill in the hospital when I got back from vacation, okay? It was a rough week for Bill. How many guys would say, right? Now, as, as crazy, as wild, and as rough of a week that was for Bill Wimberly, apparently... Uh, Did you guys know that, believe it or not, there's an even worse week coming to this planet, to the whole world one day? You see, the Bible calls it uh, the 70th week of Daniel, okay? And that's what starts the seven-year tribulation, okay? That's why we got seven years. It's that final week. And it all begins at the rapture, right after the rapture of the church, when the Antichrist makes a peace treaty with Israel. Uh, It's your worst nightmare, okay? And as we've been seeing, folks, the reason why it's such a horrible time frame is because for those who refuse to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they're going to be catapulted into that time frame. Jesus said it's the worst time of the history of mankind. So horrible, so rotten, that unless God shortened that time frame, the entire human race would be destroyed, okay? You don't want to be there, in other words, from Jesus, okay? But praise God, God's not just a God of wrath, which, again, I'll say it again, that's not a bad thing, you know. That means God's put an end to the evil and the suffering and the baloney that goes on. Anybody excited about that? Okay, but he is a God of love, and because he's a God of love, he gives us many warning signs ahead of time to let us know when it's getting close. The seven-year tribulation is certainly the rapture of the church. Therefore, in order to keep you and I from experiencing that ultimate bad day, even worse than Bill's week, okay, it's called being left behind. We're going to continue in our study, the final countdown update. All right, you guys ready for the giddy-up? Ready? There you go. All right, let's continue on. Uh, The first six updates we've already seen on the final countdown study is the Jewish people, the Antichrist, modern technology, worldwide upheaval, the rise of falsehood, and the last three times uh, was the rise of wickedness. And what we saw is God lovingly foretold you and I, here's your clue, you're living in the last days, when you see an absolute, unadulterated, wicked society all over the planet at the same time, is that happening today? Just turn on your TV, it's everywhere, okay? And we saw there's a reason why it's taking place, and that's because we have uh, now a wicked educational system, a wicked media system, a wicked anti-God or atheist system, and last time, a wicked chemical system or drug system, witchcraft, and Satanism, okay? How many guys would say stir that all together and it kind of makes things creepy? Just a little bit. The Bible says in the last days, you're going to see an increase of pharmacaea, pharmaceuticals, drugs on the planet. That's going nuts today. And we saw it's not just a little bit of witchcraft or Satanism here and there. It's being promoted right now. Listen, as we saw last time, in our media, in our schools, even in our government. They want to put statues of Satan in our government building. How far we have fallen, folks. This is all going to give an increase to that wicked society that Jesus says you don't want to be a part of, okay? But that's not all. I'm still preaching on this, so guess what? 
There's got to be more. I praise God for you, Bobby. I didn't even have to do that fake voice. Can I make it that far with your free gum? Almost, that's right. Uh, there's got to be more, and there is, folks. As you can see with the picture, the seventh update is the rise of what? Apostasy. Now, I chose that picture for a reason because that's a church building. What's wrong with that church building? It's crumbling. It's falling apart. It's being destroyed. Folks, believe it or not, the Bible says not only is the world going to go down the tubes in the last days, unfortunately, so is the church. Okay, but don't take my word for it. Once again, let's listen to God. So open your Bibles to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let's take a look here. If you find 2 Timothy, what do you do? Hang a left there. Okay. 3 Timothy, what do you do? Chuck it, it's not in the Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, as you turn there, this is an important passage, not only letting us know that we are living in the last days, okay, the rise of apostasy, but this also brings the truth home and dispels the lie that other people would say, oh, no, 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 the church is going to get better and better and better and usher in the kingdom of Jesus before he comes back. Excuse me? That's not what we see in the Bible. Might want to stick to the Bible, my recommendation. The church, the professing church, is going down the tubes, okay? It's going to apostatize. Let's take a look. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. When you get there, say moo. Moo. Whatever. That's okay. There's a demon in the house, but greater is us than he, he, you know, he that's in the story. Anyway, whatever. anyway, here's what it says. The Spirit clearly says. Now, now, what does he say? Clearly. This is common sense. This is obvious, as he's saying. That in the what? Latter times or last days... How do you know you're in the last days? And the context is the church. What's he say? Some will what? Abandon the faith. What? In the church? Abandon the faith. Listen, and they're going to follow something all right. It's not the Bible. It's not the truth. But deceiving spirits, things that are literally taught by what? Deem How many guys would say that's not a good church to be a part of? Okay, okay, let's continue on. Now, such teachings come from uh, through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Okay, they forbid people to marry. They order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving because it uh, is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. Now, I'm not done, but i got to stop here because I know you're snickering at this point. Hey, Pastor Billy, that includes chicken. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right? That's fine. Did you notice, though, it said you need to pray? And boy, if you eat that stuff, you better pray. All uh, right, this is the deal. And listen, I'm not saying you can't eat chicken. All right, hey, listen. If you want to eat it, that's up to you and God. Okay, whatever. Got to deal with the text. But listen, I'm more into celebratory, exciting food like cow. Because the Bible says that when the prodigal son, uh, when he came home, they killed the fatted cow, not the fatted chicken. Hello. Okay. And chicken's called fowl for a reason, by the way. I digress. Let's move on. Here's the point. Okay, let's continue on. All right, he says, now, if you point these things out to the brothers, okay, you're going to be what? A good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed, okay? So folks, what we see according to our text is another major characteristic. We are living in the last days, okay? Not just that the world's going down the tubes, but what's going to happen to the church? The church is going down the tubes, okay? The word that's used there is apostasy, okay? Or apostatized, if you will. It literally means some translations there. It says that they're abandoned. In the church, people are going to abandon. They're going to turn away. They're going to leave even the basic fundamentals of Christianity. Listen, for demonic teachings. It didn't just say false teachings. It said demonic teachings. That's pretty bad. And apparently, that's when the show is going to begin in the church, that means that these people are going to be pretending to be religious. They are going to give the appearance of being true Christians. When the proof is in the pudding, they're going to show the truth of their real colors by following hypocritical, lying, demonic teachings, okay? Now, the point is, granted, throughout church history, if you're a fan of that, you see that there's certain people that, you know, steer off, unfortunately, into false teaching in the church or whatever. That's been pretty commonplace. But what's not common, folks, is in the last few years, and I mean literally just since I've noticed it, a massive increase as a pastor just since God's brought us here in Vegas three years ago. I mean, this is one sign that's going nuts. I'm talking people you would think who would never slide from biblical truth are going south. And they're going south fast, okay? We're in the apostasy. Let's take a look at some of that, uh, that proof, folks. People are turning from ab abandoning the basic truths of biblical Christianity, okay? First of all, 88% of Americans claim to own a Bible. And 82% of those consider themselves knowledgeable of the Bible. 
It's one thing to say, let's demonstrate it. The problem is 43% can't even name the first five books of the Bible. But you're supposed to be knowledgeable of it? 72% don't believe the Bible is the literal word of God. Well, why not? Because 51% believe the Bible is just a book of ancient fables, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man. So why should you take it as literal if it's just a man-made book, okay? Now, that's why 55% of people in our country today say the Bible should not be taken literally, right? Now, that's the world. That's the average person that would say, oh, I'm a Christian, you know, because I'm American, which is a lie, okay? Here's the church. Professing Christians in America today, 53% say the Bible should not be taken literally as well. If the stats are right, folks, let's say there's 200 people here today, on average, 100 of you say, nope, this book right here, whooped it by man. No need to take it literally. That's in the church. That's not the world. That's in the church. That's how far we have slid in, folks, and it gets even worse as we go. 65% of professing Christians say Satan is not a living being but a symbol of evil. 25% say it doesn't matter what faith you follow because all faith groups teach the same lesson. Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, it's all the same thing. Excuse me? This is in the church, by the way. Again, 30% say Jesus died, but he never had a physical resurrection in the church today, which is apparently is why 29% say when he lived on earth, Jesus committed sins like other people. What? This is in the church. Remember what it say? You abandon, you turn away from the faith and follow demonic teachings. This is happening before our eyes. 31% of people in the church say that a good person can earn his or way into heaven. Why do we have a cross? Why did Jesus go to the cross? Absolutely insane. One third of the church today. 46% of professing Christians falsely believe that the Bible encourages the suppression of women. Well, it sounds like feminism has uh, made its inroads into the church. That's not true, folks. 33% of professing Christians say the Bible is, listen, silent on homosexuality. What Bible are you reading? Old Testament, New Testament. Be here, Lord willing, in a couple weeks. We're going to hit that again because, man, is that ramping up. Excuse me, silent on it? Give me a break. And professing Christians turn to the Scripture three times more for personal prayer than they do about discovering the truth about such topics as abortion, homosexuality, war, or poverty. The Bible has now, in the church, just been reduced a book to make you feel good. And you find in there whatever one that makes you please to please you and help you out emotionally, not to discover truth anymore about what is right or wrong. And that's why one guy said this. He said, clearly the lack of personal Bible study coupled with shallow and superficial Bible teaching in many churches today account for this failure. Nobody is listening, reading, studying the Bible, and they've come up with these demonic attitudes okay and listen here's the point folks in the last few years in the last few years it looks like there's a rise of apostasy in the church right and abandoning of the basic fundamental truths of christianity right listen this is a sign we're living in the last days just like when you turn on the tv and you see all this massive wickedness of baloney going on when you go to a church service and this is what's coming out of the pulpit you're in the last days as well it's a dual sign, folks. We're getting it from both angles, okay? Now, the question I have is, how in the world could we have such a quick mass exodus, a slide from basic Christianity in just the last few years? Well, John, thanks for asking. Oh, man, this is my last piece, too. Uh, uh, thanks for asking. It works well with my notes. I appreciate you being here today. I told you I'd get you in the sermon somehow. Uh, but, folks, the first reason why we're seeing such a massive quick slide in the church from the basic truths of Christianity is because we have apostate pulpits, and I do not shrink back from that statement. We have a massive rise of apostate pulpits across America, okay? This is what that research, folks, was saying with those statistics, okay? It spills downhill. Listen, if you have an apostate, listen, fake pastor an apostate fake pastor in the pulpit, then guess what you get? You get apostate teaching and apostate beliefs, which means you end up with an apostate church. That's how it happens. It spills downhill. Now, for those of you who think that, oh, come on, is it really that bad, Pastor Billy? I mean, is there really fake pastors in the pulpit today preaching to the church in mass? Yeah, they're all over the place, okay? In fact, if you listen to Jesus, we shouldn't be too surprised. He clearly said not everyone who claims to be his disciple really is one. Just ask Judas Iscariot. 
He is the prime example of somebody who was right there in the thick of things, and he was fake the whole time. You can fool me, you can fool this church, but you can't fool God. God knows who's real. This is what Jesus said, John chapter 6, 63 through 64, 70 and 71. Jesus speaking, the words I've spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet, there are some of you who what? Who do not believe. Now, that there demonstrates the deity of Jesus Christ. He knows the heart, right? Okay, he said, for Jesus had known for how long? From the very beginning, you can't fool him. Which of them did not believe and who would betray him? Then Jesus replied, have I not chosen you the 12? Yet one of you is a devil. And he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who though one of the 12, right down the thick of things, he was what? Jesus knew from the beginning he was going to betray him. So according to our text, Jesus speaking, this is the truth. Listen, we need to wake up and realize in the church, this is what's going on, folks. Not everyone who claims to be a disciple of Christ really is one. And it is my contention that the church is flooded with apostate, listen, fake, phony Christians, and listen, fake, phony pastors. And this is why you're seeing so much apostasy in such a short amount of time. Did you guys know that just calling yourself a pastor, okay, doesn't make you one? any more than going to a church service or a seminary. Uh, it doesn't make you a Christian or a pastor any more than sitting in a hen house makes you a chicken, right? You know, I've never really liked that. that, that let, me, let me see if I can fix it for you today. Uh, did you know that going to a church service or a seminary doesn't make you a Christian or a pastor any more than sitting in a barn makes you a cow? Yeah, much better. I, I agree. You got to be born again. Okay, but see, that's what we don't do. We don't discover. We don't ask. We don't investigate. The scripture says, examine yourselves and see if you're really in the faith. And if you're spewing out this baloney and denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that all faith teach the same thing, I'm sorry, you're not saved. How in the world can you be a born-again Christian and deny the cross of Jesus Christ and his words that he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. I'm sorry, you're not saved. Because that means you are trusting in something else What the scripture says is a false gospel, another gospel. Paul says that not just once, but twice. Let somebody, if they're preaching another gospel, let him be eternally condemned. And yet that's what you're getting from the pulpit today. And again, this is my point. Why are we seeing such a massive amount of apostasy in just a shorter amount of time? Because now it's elevated. We've got the church flooded with so many fake Christians that now that generation's grown up and gone off to seminary. So what? That doesn't save you. And now these guys are filling the pulpit. Now listen, we already saw this before. This really does happen. I don't have time to pull up those videos, but if you were here a couple studies ago on the rise of wickedness, and we dealt with those atheist churches that are on the rise... Remember that? We saw that. There was that one guy in England, remember him? For 40 years, and he's still going strong. He's an atheist and a bishop of that church in England and admits it. We also saw that the atheist pastor in the Bible Belt said he was a Christian for 25 years, a Christian pastor, and he decided to become an atheist. No, you weren't. The Bible says you were a Judas because if you were with us, you would have remained with us. First John, we saw before. The reason why you went was because you never belonged to us. You were fake the whole time. And folks, I'm telling you, those guys are not the only ones. That's the tip of the iceberg. These guys are now starting to come out of the closet, so to speak, with their atheism, and fake pastors are all over the pulpit today, giving rise to major apostasy. Here's another one on camera. Let's take a look at this guy. First question out of the gate is just simply, how the heck do you just up and become atheist after being a pastor for a whole year? Um, I think over the years there have just been some growing differences between uh, myself and the denomination, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, over theology, some policy issues, um, some um, social issues, our uh, desire to uh, stand with the gay and lesbian population uh, in our community and members of our church that were uh, gay, lesbian, transgender members. And um, so we came to some disagreements that were, um, you know, irreconcilable, and I think we all agreed that it was, um, I had sort of outgrown my place in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So how do you just turn away from, from Christ just like that? Yeah, I mean, people have made those kinds of statements. Um, again, I, I think um, religion and faith are things that are full of nuance and people's personal experiences. You know, my experience is not like that of some others. And I think the tendency that people have is to think of religion and faith 
in binary categories. So you're either all of one thing or you're all of another thing. Either you're completely a Christian and completely sold on all the ideas about being a Christian or you're an atheist and you've completely abandoned all faith. And I think the reality that I've discovered in the last six days for sure is that the vast majority of people are somewhere between those two poles and uh, I'm with them in that middle space. Listen to how he just defined the vast majority of church goers today in America. And he's with them. That apparently it's okay to be perfectly fine to be an atheist who supports the gay agenda and a Christian at the same time. Is that true? No. Folks, how many Judases are actually out there? And this is behind the pulpit. And I'm telling you, folks, this is happening on a massive scale across America. you got these fake guys behind the pulpit. Okay? Now, here's the point. What's helping these guys to thrive in the church today is a demonic, and I'll say that, a demonic false teaching. Remember, that's what he said. They're going to follow something, all right, not the Bible, but demonic false teaching, and that's the demonic false teaching of the lie of the church growth movement. That has so impacted the church today, folks. It's absolutely insane. And what the church grow I'm telling you from seminary on down, I've been a pastor on both coasts now, folks, and been a Christian for over 21 years. And I'm telling you that this stuff, they've attempted to put it into my brain. It's a new way to do church. And it's leading to this apostasy. And what they would have you and I believe is you don't even need a real pastor who teaches the Bible. You no, because the pastor has been reduced to a businessman. He's a CEO. He's just a front man who's up there to tell you pop secular psychology. Not a person who's out there preaching the word of God. You don't need that. Okay, he's just a figurehead today. And what they say is, listen, you need to start using, you need to turn the church into a body of people, into a business. And you need to start using secular business ideals, slick marketing techniques, and then whoever you get as your front runner, saved or not, who cares, make sure that he preaches fluff and only fluff from the pulpit. Now, first of all, we know that there's nothing wrong with church growth per se. But don't get the cart before the horse. Jesus said the number one growth you need to be concerned about with in the church is spiritual growth. And that only comes when you preach the word of God. And this is what Jesus clearly says, folks. Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Anybody say amen for that? Amen. amen. Therefore, go and what? Make disciples, church. All of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Okay? And I'm surely, Jesus said, with you always, even to the very end of the age. Okay? And so this is the classic passage we all call the Great Commission, right? Notice it wasn't the grand suggestion. Notice it wasn't the great thing to talk about over a cup of coffee. Or the thing that you need to launch a committee over for 18 months to discover the feasibility of that program. No, it's the Great Commission, which means it's in order to be obeyed, and it's from Jesus. And he says, we, the church, are to get out there. Yes, we share the gospel, right? But we get out there, and when these people get saved, what do you do with them? You disciple them. You bring them into the church. You help them to grow up spiritually. He didn't say, get out there and make a bunch of believers. He didn't say, get out there and make a bunch of professional pew sitters. Even though, give it up for Joey Polsterino. He finished the job. That's right. He's making it easy for us today. That's right. No, no, we are to get out there and to make disciples. It's the Greek word mathetes, where we get mathematics. It means discipline learner. You are to get into this book, the Bible. You are to grow up and be like Jesus Christ, not this world. You get in here and you become a student of the word of God. That's what Jesus said. We need to be primarily concerned about spiritual growth, number one. Now, when you do that first, of course, the church grows because people get saved. There's nothing wrong with growth, but don't get the cart before the horse. And see, that's what we're being tricked, folks. Because there's a whole new focus in the church today. This spiritual growth thing, the teaching the Bible, making disciples, that's old-fashioned. Haven't you heard? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. We need to be concerned with numerical growth and at all costs. I mean all costs. And the way that you do that, according to these guys, is you need to act like the world. You need to be like the world. You need to believe like the world. You need to sing like the world. You need to uh, speak like the world, think like the world, do business like the world. Why? So the world will like you. Why, they say, because if the world likes you, then when they come to your services, they'll stick around. And if they stick around, boy, your numbers will go through the roof. Whoa! And isn't, listen, isn't that what makes for a successful church today when you have a whole bunch of numbers? 
See, we know better. Denominations all across the United States, that's the pressure that's put upon pastors today. And you're made to look like a subpar pastor if you don't have big numbers like this guy down the road here or this guy down there. Excuse me, you're going to stand before Jesus Christ as a pastor and he's going to ask you how many disciples, not how many numbers. But this is coming from the top. It's not just the pastors. This is how pastors today in America are being trained, okay? So that people can stick around. And I've said before, if you've got 500 people, I don't care if you've got 5,000 people in your congregation, but only five of them are saved, what in the world did you just accomplish? you trying to encourage people to go to hell from the pulpit? What is it? And I'm telling you, as insane as this is, this is the premise, folks. This is the lie, the demonic lie of the church growth uh, teaching, okay? And they say in order to keep these people, get away from the Bible, you just do stuff that's going to entertain them, make them feel good, do something of shock value, just so they'll keep coming back next week for the show. You see, you don't believe me, so I'm going to give you some proof. Are you guys tired of sitting through that same old boring sermon and that same old boring church service, and you want to spice things up? Pray, I th- actually thought a couple of you would do and say, thank you for saying nothing. <laughs> right. I don't have any more gum, so I love you guys. Go to the potluck and get some nuclear jello or something. But anyway, that's right. right? But hey, that's right. Don't you want to spice things up, folks? That's right. Hey, how would you like to go to this church service? How about this will get the numbers up. How about if we went to a full-blown nude church? Yeah, where nobody wears clothes, not even the pastor. Woo-wee! Now, see, again, you think I'm kidding. And I'm not. People will do anything just to get the numbers to go up. This is how far we have gone. Let's take a look at this guy. While you went to church this morning in your Sunday best, about an hour's drive south of Richmond, there's a small congregation that really doesn't worry about material things. They worship the way God brought us all into the world, naked. And before I tell you why, a word of warning. We blurred out some of the video, but this story does contain partial nudity and may not be appropriate for everyone. This is a congregation that often worships the same way God brought them into the world, unadorned. So on this particular Sunday morning, parishioners are in various states of undress. Some nude, some fully clothed, others topless. He chose to have faith in God. But it's not about the clothes or lack thereof. Stand up on your feet. Pastor Alan Parker is here to bear his soul to Christ and lead his flock down the path of righteousness no matter what they have on. This time of year, the Sunday service is usually a little more than half full, but in the summer months, it's standing room only. Huh? It'll work. I'm, you, come on. Don't you guys know what a successful church is today? It's a church that's got big numbers, and if it's got big numbers, it must have the blessing of God upon it. No. Did you know the Jewish people that had the same lie with the Pharisees? See, the Pharisees had a lot of money, by and large. And people thought, well, because they had a lot of money, because they had this stature, it must be the blessing of God. Being repeated today, the same lie. Excuse me? Folks, it is this bad, okay? In order to get the numbers up, you do whatever you got to do, right? Now, first of all, let's set the record straight. If you guys think that Bill Wimbley's ever getting up here in anything other than his normal Sunday attire, I'm telling you to stand up and... He's already had a bad enough week while I was gone, as we saw at the beginning. We're not going to make it worse. No offense, Bill, but anyway, let's move on. Okay, but seriously, this is why you're seeing this insane, outrageous behavior in the church. This isn't the world. This is the church. You got to do what it takes in order to get the numbers to go up. Now, listen, it's not just that. It's not just entertain them, spice things up, okay? Another major lie from the church growth movement is you need to only teach that which makes people feel good. And you do not teach anything from this book that might damage, here it comes, their self-esteem. Now, I'm not making this up, okay? Which means, therefore, according to that lie, you can't preach anything from the Bible that might upset them because if you upset them, then what are they going to do? They're going to leave, and you can't have that because if they leave, what happens to your numbers? The numbers go down. You see, believe it or not, it's called fluff. 
And did you know the Apostle Paul says, when you see only fluff coming from the pulpit, it's another sign you're in the last days. I didn't say that. He did. You tell me if this scripture is not fulfilled before our very eyes. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead in view of his appearing and his kingdom. In other words, he's coming back. So I give you this charge, young Pastor Timothy. How are you going to be a great godly pastor? What do you got to do before Jesus comes back? Number one, preach the word. That's all of it, man. Give them the Bible is what you do if you're a good preacher. Be prepared in season and out of season. In other words, whether they like it, lump it, leave it or not, you're going to have to stand before God. Teachers get a double judgment, the scripture says. And here's what you do. Make them feel good, pamper them. I'm sorry, wrong translation. Who put that up there? I'm sorry. Correct. Oops. Rebuke. How many of you guys woke up this morning and go, yeah, I can't wait to get rebuked. So it means when the scripture, sometimes you're not going to come here, quote, feeling good, are you? Now, is that bad? No, it's for our good, right? It's called discipline. And, of course, yes, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Why? Because listen, what's coming? A time's going to come in the church, the context, when men will not put up a sound doctrine. They don't want to hear the Bible anymore. Instead, to suit their own desires, they, the church, will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths, muthos, literally stories made up. Now, folks, this is an amazing passage here. Paul says it's going to get so bad in the last days in the church. In the church. People are not going to put up with sound doctrine. People in the church can say, Pastor, would you stop preaching the Bible? That's how bad it's going to get if you're in the last days. Now, the Greek where I love this, for itchy ears, tickle your ears. It's the Greek word kinetho. And you know what that word means in the Greek? It means only pleasant thing. How do you know you're living the last days? When you go to a church service or you turn into the so-called church services on TV and the only thing you ever get from the pulpit is only pleasant things. You're in the last days. That's what Paul says, Okay. Folks, this passage is being fulfilled before our very eyes, and I'll say this every time, every time, not just when you turn on your TV and you see somebody murdered this and this bomb went over here and they did this and this atrocious, wicked behavior is the sign in the last days, but every time you turn on your TV and you see one of these impotent, worldly, sissy preachers tickling people's ears every week, you're in the last days. This is what's going to happen to the church. We get phone calls, emails, ask Tom, wherever Tom's at. If he got raptured, we're in trouble. But anyway... <laughs> Every week, I'm not making this up and I'm not saying this to boast. Every week we get phone calls, emails from people all across the United States and around the world. And it's the same story, same sad story. Pastor Billy, we can't find a healthy church. We can't find something as basic as somebody who will preach us the Bible, all the Bible, not just some of it, not just the happy stuff. We can't find anything. What do we do? Long gone are the days when you say, well, just go five minutes down this road to this community church or this Baptist church here, this way. That's gone. And praise God, God's given us at the same time the technology to reach out to these folks, to encourage them while the apostasy is in high gear. Now, what's the problem is, folks, this whole, this happy stuff, just fluff and all this stuff. You don't preach the whole counsel of God. Just stick to the parts that people like to build up their self-esteem. And, you know, no hell, no wrath, no sin talk, no repentance. Just heaven and grace. and right. It's created what's called the McChurch. Watch this. One guy says, our culture demands convenience Christianity. We want it short, simple, fast, and cheap. The McBible uh, doesn't have the tedious 66 books, just a few short sentences uh, and some simple words at fifth grade level. And the McWorship service is full of sweetness and love and nothing offensive. The McSermon is easily digested with a minimum amount of nutrition and a maximum amount of fat. The McPrayer is centered on temporal, material things to keep the mind from wandering to the spiritual, which is elusive for the modern American. And to keep the kids awake, the McHymns are hip-hop style. And McMarriages are performed by folks who like quickie relationships and throwaway vows. That's another big feature. The McPastor, hey, he's a touchy-feely guy who's majored in pop psychology. He's got an in-depth understanding of your every felt need. And mixed sins, pff, we call them boo-boos. 
Uh, they're easily forgiven. Uh, they're easily forgiven uh, with fast prayers, and of course, they're soon repeated, but not taken too seriously. The McYouth program, it's short on Bible study, long on fun and games. It's designed to give kids what they want so their parents can go out in the evenings and not worry about their kids getting involved in drugs or sex. And, and McSalvation, uh, it doesn't have any deep doctrine of substitutionary atonement or regeneration. No, it's just a simple human decision or not of the head. Uh, and it's, it's adequate to bring persons uh, into the McKingdom, where they will live happily ever after. And of course, all this ends up in McHeaven, where there are no golden streets, but arches that appear over a broad entrance, where the grill is scorching and the deep fry grease is super hot. In other words, what you just created was a bunch of fake Christians headed straight to hell. This is the new way to do church today. All because you listened to the lie of the church growth movement. You never told these people all the Bible. You didn't tell them from the pulpit about the dangers of hell, eternal damnation, God's wrath, his hatred of sin. You certainly didn't talk about the return of Jesus Christ. It was all there. It was right here in the Bible. But you didn't preach it because you sold out. Because you just wanted to have a bunch of numbers. For what? To impress your denomination? Your fellow pastors? Yourself? In fact, folks, it's getting so bad in the church today. This blew me away. I got this week. Did you know, and this is in the church, it's becoming illegal to say that somebody is a sinner in need of a Savior in the church. Check this out. Child Evangelism Fellowship, a nationally recognized Christian group that seeks to reach children with the gospel of Jesus Christ, is under fire. Why? Because they're teaching kids the biblical doctrine of sin and eternal judgment as well as sharing the love and mercy of God. Quote, those who oppose the group assert that because of this, CEF does not present Jesus loves you mainstream Christianity. And they claim that this organization is a hardcore evangelical fundamental organization. Quote, they pretend to be mainstream uh, Christian Bible study when in fact they're a very old fundamentalist sect. And the preaching to children about sin, quote, this is in the church, Preaching children about sin might, quote, give them feelings of fear and shame. So supporters have organized a group against CEF called Protect Portland's Children. This is where it's happening. Which seeks to speak out against CEF's message that you're a sinner in need of a savior and to influence parents to not allow their children to attend its events. This is in the church. This ain't the world. I expect that from the world. This is in the church. And one so-called pastor said this, As a seminary-educated clergy member, I see the tactics being used as a form of coercion similar to a cult. Telling kids that they're a sinner in need of a savior is now being defined as a cult by so-called fellow Christians. And he says this, Parents who send their children to clubs that operate on fear should be prepared to see their children suffer from mental illness issues. That's a guy behind the pulpit in the church. That's how bad it is. In fact, they got a Facebook page. And here's their profile picture. I'm not making this up. This is not Photoshop. Here's what they want us to now tell kids about eternity. I'm not a sinner. I'm not a sinner. In order to go to heaven, what's the first thing you need to acknowledge? I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Please save me. Please forgive me. And in the church, not the world, in the church, they're saying, nuh uh, that will damage their self esteem. That doesn't build them up. It doesn't make them feel good. So now we have little kids holding signs up saying, I am not a sinner, which means, you know what? You're not going to heaven. Can Can I extrapolate that even further? Which means you're going to hell. This is coming from the church. If you think that's bad, folks, it's getting even worse than that. We have now church leaders not only not teaching the gospel, and actually saying that the gospel is detrimental to people, certainly children. But we now have people from the pulpit, church leaders, who are now preaching the same message of Satanism. The number one law of Satanism is do what you will shall be the whole of the law. In other words, it's all about yourself. Self, self, self. That's what's being preached today. Joel Osteen, the king of fluff, who will only preach fluff by his own admission. I'm not saying anything different than he will say recently allowed his wife, Victoria, to speak from the pulpit about what she felt was important for us, the church, to hear. 
And what she shared was the number one important thing in life is it's all about you. It's all about making yourself feel good, including your so-called worship of God. Here's her words. It's the exact same message of Satanism coming from the church. Let's take a look at that. Attention all Christians. When you go to church next Sunday, you might not be doing it for God, but to satisfy your own selfish needs. Can you believe that? That's what some people are saying, or at least that's how people are interpreting the remarks that were made by popular Lakewood Church co-pastor Victoria Osteen. Check this out. Victoria Osteen, check this out. I just want to encourage every one of us to realize when we obey God, we're not doing it for God. I mean, that's one way to look at it. We're doing it for ourselves. Because God takes pleasure when we're happy. That's the thing that gives Him the greatest joy this morning. So I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church, when you worship Him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself. Because that's what makes God happy. Amen. Founded in San Francisco, California by Anton LaVey in 1966, the Church of Satan sees belief in God or hell as delusional, and so they choose to practice self-reliance and self-worship. This is a very selfish religion. We believe in greed, we believe in selfishness, we believe in all of the lustful thoughts that motivate man because this is man's natural. Uh, the Church of Satan has chosen Satan as its primary symbol because in Hebrew it means adversary, opposer, one to accuse or question. And we see ourselves as being the Satans, the adversaries, opposers and accusers of all spiritual belief systems that would try to hamper enjoyment of our life as a human being. Now, if a Christian said to you, you were just really worshipping yourself, what would you say? In a sense they would be right. Uh, it is a form of self-worship. Uh, you were a Satanist for how long? Twelve years. 12 years. Twelve years. What does uh, it mean to be a Satanism, to have Satan as a God? To adore or to to uh, to adore Satan. Your servant Satan. Your servant self. More than anything else, it's ah, egocentric, okay. self-centered. Serve me. All is me. Immediate gratification. That's what all it's about. And now, that's being preached from the pulpit across America. Even the so-called worship of God has nothing to do with God. It has to do with the God of that's the number one law of Satanism. And you wonder why we're seeing the apostasy. I'll close with this, folks. Uh, Jesus sets the tone. Matthew 16, verse 24, he said, If anyone would come after me, what's the first thing you do? You need to deny yourself. It's not about you, it's about him. You pick up your cross and you follow him. God the Father says, Isaiah 42, verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols, including the idol itself. It's about him, it's not about us. That's who we're supposed to worship. That's true worship. And here's the point. Who in the world would have thought, this is happening in our lifetime. Who would have thought, listen, that it would, in our lifetime, that the church would not just be flooded with fake, phony Christians, but fake, phony pastors in the pulpit in droves. And then the church would actually consider illegal and harmful the basic biblical truth that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. And now it's getting so bad that the church is walked away from the Bible and is preaching the same message of Satanism, of self-love. And Paul says this, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, 4, and 5. He says, but mark this. There's going to be some terrible times in the last days. How do you know you're in the last days? What's the number one thing he said you better be on the lookout for? When you see people doing this, oh man, you better look up because Jesus Christ is coming back. Number one, he says, people will be lovers of what? Themselves. It's one thing for the world to do that. But now it's being preached in the church. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It's all about you making yourself feel good, right? And they got this form of godliness. They look like Christians. They go to a church service, right? But they deny its power. Have nothing to do with them. Can I translate that for you? They're apostate run. All this is happening right now before our very eyes. And Jesus says this. Listen, folks, when these things begin to take place, Christian, you better stand up. You better lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Jesus Christ is coming back. He's coming back to get his true church, his true bride, who does love him and who does worship only him and who sticks to his word. Not a false gospel that leads people to hell. Folks, these are the days that we live in. It's privileged times. Yes, it's kind of scary. Yeah, it's kind of freaky. But it's privileged at the same time. Because that means while this is going on, there is one thing that can make a difference. His name is Jesus Christ. 
I will share this with you, though. You might need to be prepared to realize you don't just witness outside the church. Sometimes you might have to find yourself witnessing inside the church. Not everybody who goes to a church service is a Christian any more than sitting in a barn makes you a cow. Ooh, I got to say it twice. Ooh, there you go. You got to be born again. And that only happens when you admit that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. I deserve to go to hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ took the death penalty in my place. And it's his work and his work alone that will rescue me. Oh, what a wretch I am. But in Christ, I can be forgiven and become a child of God. That's what people need to hear today from the church. Amen? Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries. And I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven. And that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness or the wrong things that we have done have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin or unholiness uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not, the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma, even though God already knows it all. And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy. We're not perfect like him. Uh, let's take a, a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, the Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you have ever told a lie before? Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal. Okay, how many have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, we've already said we're a bunch of liars. Okay, well, we've all done that. And it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, it could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, that means that we're a thief. Okay, the Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy. And that's why one of the Ten Commandments says you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Hey, folks, isn't it ironic how uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word? Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy, okay? And folks, let's be honest. We've used God's name in vain uh, before. The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pulled the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that, and it's just as bad. He knows the mind. He knows the hearts, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God. And you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn. 
We, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it. And a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says we shall be saved. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, in life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, the courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, they are going to jail and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, as they're sitting there in the jail cell, uh, it, it's a proven fact they did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, there's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a death row. And that's if the one in authority, the governor, if he were to, out of mercy and kindness, nothing that the person did, because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it, and they can't earn it, if he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely of their crimes uh, against the state. And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell and handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who've said, no, I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day that you're still alive, God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins, to trust in his work on the cross, to pardon us from all of our crimes, our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that? right now well this has been pastor billy crone of sunrise baptist church and and get a life ministries and if there's anything that we can do for you uh please don't hesitate uh to contact us uh our number our information will uh come up here on the screen shortly and uh, uh if there's anything we could do for you please don't hesitate to let us know uh thank you for uh joining us and uh remember i hope to see you in heaven god bless Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com. When it's getting close, the seven-year tribulation is certainly the rapture of the church. Therefore, in order to keep you and I from experiencing that ultimate bad day, even worse than Bill's week, okay, and it's called being left behind. We're going to continue in our study, the final countdown update. All right, you guys ready for the giddy up? Ready? There you go. All right, let's continue on. Uh, the first six updates we've already seen on the final countdown study is the Jewish people, the Antichrist, modern technology, worldwide upheaval, the rise of falsehood, and the last three times 
uh, was the rise of wickedness. And what we saw is God lovingly foretold you and I, here's your clue, you're living in the last days. When you see an absolute, unadulterated, wicked society all over the planet at the same time, is that happening today? Just turn on your TV, it's everywhere, okay? And we saw there's a reason why it's taking place, and that's because we have uh, now a wicked educational system, a wicked media system, a wicked anti-God or atheist system, and last time, a wicked chemical system or drug system, witchcraft, and Satanism, okay? How many of you guys would say you stir that all together and it kind of makes things creepy? Just a little bit. The Bible says in the last days, you're going to see an increase of pharmacaea, pharmaceuticals, drugs on the planet. That's going nuts today. And we saw it's not just a little bit of witchcraft or Satanism here and there. It's being promoted right now. Listen, as we saw last time, in our media, in our schools, even in our government. They want to put statues of Satan in our government building. How far we have fallen, folks. This is all. Amen. Well, as I baited you guys, uh, apparently, uh, again, it was last week while I was on vacation. Bill, he had a rough week, right, Bill? Oh, thank you for playing along. And apparently, he got up that Monday morning, and he was getting ready for work, and Diane approaches him, and she goes, hey, I bet you don't know what today is. And so, Bill, he just kind of indignantly, he just, well, of course I do, right? So get this, man, 10 a.m. that morning, Diane gets a box of long stem roses delivered to her office, right? And then at 1 p.m., she gets this foil-wrapped two-pound box of her favorite chocolate. And then later that day, a boutique delivered a designer dress for her. And Diane, she couldn't take it anymore, right? So she calls Bill at work, and she says, Honey, <laughs> this has been the best Groundhog Day ever. <laughs> this is awesome, right? Yeah. So Bill, he's steaming about all that money he just spent on Groundhog Day gifts, right? And so, uh, but he had to go to the dentist to get some work done on his teeth, right? And he gets there, and the dentist sits him in the chair, and he says, Open wider. And then he shouted to Bill, he goes, good grief, you've got the biggest cavity I've ever seen. The biggest cavity I've ever seen. And Bill said, okay, listen, Doc, I'm scared enough without you saying something like that twice. And the dentist said, I didn't, that was the echo. <laughs> and so now Bill's leaving the dentist's office, right? And he's going down the elevator and he sees this golden retriever on the floor next to this guy. And, and being a pet lover and all, so he asks the guy, he says, hey, he's, uh, does your dog bite? And the guy says, nope, sure doesn't. So Bill, you know, he lowers his hand to pet the dog, and all of a sudden the dog bites Bill's hand, starts tearing it apart, shredding on it, chewing it, and Bill's screaming and swinging the dog around the elevator, trying to get it off his hand, right? And finally he gets the dog off of his hand, throws it out of the elevator, and so he menacingly looks over to that guy and says, hey, I thought you said your dog didn't bite. And the guy says, he doesn't. That's not my dog. <laughs> right? And so finally after this, Bill makes it home, and he sees Diane. She's sitting on the couch. She's chewing her nails, right? And apparently this is a pet. all going to give an increase to that wicked society that Jesus says you don't want to be a part of, okay? But that's not all. I'm still preaching on this, so guess what? There's got to be more. I praise God for you, Bobby. I didn't even have to do that fake voice. Can I make it that far with your free gum? Almost. That's right. Uh, there's got to be more, and there is, folks. As you can see with the picture, the seventh update is the rise of what? apostasy. Now, I chose that picture for a reason because that's a church building. What's wrong with that church building? It's crumbling. It's falling apart. It's being destroyed. Folks, believe it or not, the Bible says not only is the world going to go down the tubes in the last days, unfortunately, so is the church. Okay, but don't take my word for it. Once again, let's listen to God. So open your Bibles to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let's take a look here. If you find 2 Timothy, what do you do? Hang a left there, okay. Third Timothy, what do you do? 
Chuck it, it's not in the Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, as you turn there, this is an important passage, not only letting us know that we are living in the last days, okay, the rise of apostasy, but this also brings the truth home and dispels the lie that other people would say, oh, no, 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 the church is going to get better and better and better and usher in the kingdom of Jesus before he comes back. Excuse me? That's not what we see in the Bible. Might want to stick to the Bible, my recommendation. The church, the professing church, is going down the tubes. Okay, it's going to apostatize. Let's take a look. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. When you get there, say moo. 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 Whatever. Eva Bill's chewing the nails, right? And, and so she reassured him that, listen, uh, she's got a new solution to cure her habit of biting her nails. And she went out and bought a whole year's supply of these Lee press-on nail kit things, right? And so Bill said, unfortunately, without thinking, well, that's a great idea. Now you can eat them straight out of the box. Now, you know why I visited Bill in the hospital when I got back from vacation, okay? It was a rough week for Bill. How many guys would say, right? Now, as, as crazy, as wild, and as rough of a week that was for Bill Wimberly, apparently, uh, did you guys know that, believe it or not, there's an even worse week coming to this planet, to the whole world one day? You see, the Bible calls it uh, the 70th week of Daniel, Okay, and that's what starts the seven-year tribulation, okay? That's why we got seven years. It's that final week. And it all begins at the rapture, right after the rapture of the church, when the Antichrist makes a peace treaty with Israel. Uh, it's your worst nightmare, okay? And as we've been seeing, folks, the reason why it's such a horrible time frame is because for those who refuse to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they're going to be catapulted into that time frame. Jesus said it's the worst time in the history of mankind. So horrible, so rotten, that unless God shortened that time frame, the entire human race would be destroyed, okay? You don't want to be there, in other words, from Jesus, okay? But praise God, God's not just a God of wrath, which, again, I'll say it again, that's not a bad thing, you know? That means God's putting an end to the evil and the suffering and the baloney that goes on. Anybody excited about that? Okay, but he is a God of love, and because he's a God of love, he gives us many warning signs ahead of time to let us know 